You know, in this series, we've seen Jesus in the highest place. We've seen him as the preeminent, personal, and powerful Lord over all creation. And since we've caught a glimpse of his greatness, what do we do with it? Better yet, what does it do to us? Better hold on. Things are about to get really The next to last message um, in our series on Zoom Out of Colossians will be in verses 7 next week, but we're going to look at this little section in verses 2 through 6, talking about the believer's impact. Now, I know in many of your Bibles, um, it will probably give a heading for this section. And of course, you know, we have the chapters and the verses that weren't, or the verse numbers that weren't all there in the original. Uh, they've been added afterwards, but also... Sometimes our Bibles will have these little headings uh, to try to give us an idea of what's about to come or a particular section or section change or topic change. And my Bible, in this section that we're going to look at this morning, says further instructions. Your Bible may also say something like that. It may set verses 2 through 6 apart and say final instructions or, or various instructions. And if we look at that heading, it almost seems as though that this section is different than the rest. And I don't know that it is. I think, I think that it's, it's all right for us to look at that section heading that says further instructions, but I think it's important for us to realize that there seems to be a connection of verses 2 through 6 in relationship to the previous verses. Because you may remember that the first half of Colossians was incredibly theological, the Christology that was presented to us in the first half of Colossians was literally mind-blowing. I mean, it is, it is just incredible to try to think about this preeminent creator above all things, by all things, for all things, and in all things is He in that sense, that He is greater than all of those things. And yet now we are seeing the practical application of our faith in light of this great big God. And one of the areas that we looked at last week was that the gospel of Christ is not just the message that saves us, but the model that shapes us. And the gospel is intended to permeate my marriage, my relationship with my children, and even the sphere of relationship in my career or my job, my work life. That there are all these spheres that we have in our life, and the gospel is a model for us and how to live in all of them. And I believe he continues really with this same theme about the gospel and the transformation and the model in the life of us in some specific ways. Let me read in verse 2 through 6. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. I believe there are four different parts of life of the believer right here. I believe Paul includes these four for a reason. And I think this morning it's important as we go through each of these four different parts of our life, I hope that we will ask this one question, God, how are you using this area in my life? Or better yet, God, am I allowing you to use these areas of my life for your good? Because I believe God wants us to have an impact for His Son, Jesus. And that's why we're here. I mean, God is doing a transformative work in us and wants to utilize us for the glory of Christ while we're here. So we're going to see this next sphere. I can't get over verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Let me take off my theological hat just for a second and just kind of talk practically for a minute. We hear about prayer. We hear sermons on prayer. 
We talk about prayer. We think about prayer. We pray about prayer. I don't know that we do that. But I just want you to step back for a minute. I mean, just, just step back. Clear your mind for a minute. And to think that God, this God, who created everything, and by Him all things consist. That God wants to hear from me. Does that not blow your mind? That this God that is, that I can't, I can spend all of my life trying to, just bigger than I can comprehend. That that God who sits atop of everything and holds all things together and works out His perfect sovereign plan and every tribe, nation, and tongue will bow before Him and confess Jesus is Lord. I mean, this God wants to hear from me. Wants to hear from you. Because He instituted this way that we can communicate with Him. We can talk with Him because He wants us. We have always serve and worship a God who delights in connecting with His creation, especially us. And He instituted prayer so that truly, truly, I can talk to the Creator of God anytime I want, for as long as I want, about anything I want. That is awesome. I can talk to the Creator of all things as a believer about anything I want, as long as I want, whenever I want. Prayer is an incredible resource. It's an incredible weapon in the spiritual life, in in our spiritual warfare, and in our battles. You've heard before the, 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 the four different types of prayer. We use the acrostic acts to, to describe it. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Basically, all four of those are us communicating to God through an exercise of prayer of faith. And Paul says to them, continue steadfastly in prayer. Persist. Don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Don't be disappointed when you don't see what you want to see. Don't be sleepy and drowsy so that you're not praying like the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. No, stay persistent. Continue in prayer. Jesus taught an entire parable on the importance of persistence of prayer. He used two figures that everybody in the time would have known. A judge who held incredible power and a widow who held none. And Jesus says that 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 judge did not fear God nor regard man, and yet the widow had a claim, and she continued to make her claim to the judge. And the judge didn't care about the woman. He didn't care about what was right. He could not get any kind of a bribe or anything out of this woman because Jesus told the story of people from two ends of the power spectrum, and this widow had none. But because she continued, continued to persist in her request, the judge finally found in her favor. Jesus taught that entire parable about not giving up in prayer. I believe some of the reason our prayers don't get answered is not just that they're not prayed, but that we don't keep praying. God wants us to exercise our faith. There's always a spiritual lesson. To be watchful in it. Be aware of what's around as you're praying but do it with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, friends, is a recognition of what we have. Thanksgiving is that beautiful mixture when both the gift and the giver are combined. We understand what we have and who we got it from, and it is our natural response to return thanks to the one who gave what we have. Continue in prayer, he says. Don't give up. Church family, I don't know what you've been praying about. Some of you may have been praying for a long time. For many, many, many years over something. And now you're seeing fruit. Maybe you you haven't seen the fruit yet. I pray that you would continue steadfastly in prayer. Do not give up. And then he says, while I got you praying, he says, I want you to pray for this. 
At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison, that I may make it clear in how I ought to speak. If number one was prayer, I believe number two is this. God wants to use our place. I want to be honest with you. This letter was written in a cold, dark prison. It was written by a man who was in prison, not for any bad that he did, but for the good that he did, for preaching and proclaiming Jesus Christ. He was in prison being persecuted for his faith. And he's writing this letter. Now think about this. You have just written a letter that is going to be shared in this church and regionally. It's going to be shared in Colossae. It's going to be shared in Laodicea. It's going to be shared in Hierapolis. It's going to be shared in the Tri-City area. Other Christians are going to hear it. And Paul says, while you're praying, pray for us. And this is how I want you to pray. I want you to pray for an open door. Now, I will tell you, if I'm ever in prison and I send you a letter, I'm going to say I want you to pray for an open door. I want that open door to be swinging outward. I want to get out. But that's not what he prays for. The door Paul was asking for was not one that would swing out, but one that would swing in. That's what he's asking for. Even in the midst of sitting in prison as an innocent man, even sitting in that painful, crazy place, he is saying, listen, I'm not asking you to get me out of here. And let me tell you, he knew what it was to get out of prison miraculously. He knew it. And he's saying, I'm not asking you to get me out of here. I'm asking you that you would pray and not give up and ask God to use me in this place. Oftentimes in the middle of our painful moments, uncomfortable moments, unknown moments, whatever you want to say, we're tempted to say, God, get me out of here. And what if it's not so much about God getting us out of here, but what God wants us to get out of it? That's what it is. What if, what if you and I had that kind of an attitude to say, you know what, God's aware of what's going on in here, and there's nothing in my life that's happened to me that has not first come through His hands. So if I'm here, I have to realize He's got a plan for me here. The open doors that He's asking for, I believe are open ears. As he said to the Philippians, that all the palace guard may hear. Open hearts to to believe, to receive the message of the gospel to the prisoners that were there, those who were literally a captive audience to him, the other soldiers who were watching him and chained to him. But he also prayed for the open door of his mouth. And oftentimes as believers, we're tempted to pray for open ears, of our lost friends and open hearts of our lost friends and not pray for our own open mouth. That we may know how we ought to speak. Open doors. There's a really good chance that these people that Paul is writing to had either experienced persecution for their faith in that region or were going to experience persecution for their faith. And Paul does something really cool here. He says, I want you to pray that God would open a door for the gospel to blow this place open. But then he says, on account of which is why I'm in prison. Did you get that? He says, I'm in prison for telling other people about Jesus. What can they do to me? Right? I'm already in prison. Worst they could do is take his life, right? The same man that understood they could take his life said, for death death to me is gain. He understood that. He's saying to them, listen, I'm in here and I'm not afraid. I I want God to direct my words. I want God to open my mouth. I want God to open their heart. I want God to open their ears. I don't care if that's the very reason I'm in here being punished. I want to be faithful to the Lord that I may make it clear 
which is how I ought to speak. I hope that when we are in those seasons, maybe it's a difficulty in your job. Maybe there's a difficulty in your home life right now. Maybe there are relationships, or maybe there's a physical place right now that you're not comfortable. You may feel like you're in prison. Let me encourage you. Before you ask God to remove you, ask God, how can I use this moment for your good? How can I use this season? And that's hard. It is. It's so hard because we want to be delivered. But I pray that you and I would seek God's fruit over freedom in those situations. That's what Paul did. He sought fruit for the kingdom over his own personal freedom. Number three, walk in wisdom toward outsiders making the best use of time. We already know what a walk is. Paul's defined that for us earlier, given us the teaching on that. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, if you look up there, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, this is our life, the visible manifestation of our faith walk, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. But now we're called to walk Wisdom. Be wise in our dealings. Knowledge is what to do, right? It's, it's the truth of the word. And then they say wisdom is how to apply what you know. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. You and I are supposed to be able to walk wisely towards outsiders. Outsiders. What's Paul saying here? Is he referring to outsiders as those people who are outside of the local church? Maybe. Are the outsiders that Paul is referring to, are they people who are outside of the family of God that aren't saved? Quite possibly. Regardless of whether he's speaking of just those who are outside of the church or more, more probable, those who are outside of the family of God, those who are lost, the point is this. He is making a line. He's saying there are those who are inside and those who are outside. And let me tell you something. Being outside is a terrible place. Jesus referred to hell as a place of outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. In the story of the rich man and Lazarus, Lazarus was brought into Abraham's bosom. He was inside. The rich man was outside in torment. Jesus, in Mark chapter 4, tells his disciples very early in his ministry, he says, for you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but for those who are outside, I speak in parables. You know what Jesus was saying? Insiders? No. No. Insiders understand. Outsiders, they don't understand. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul, the same guy that wrote this letter, he said to them that we judge those on the inside. God judges those on the outside. Wow. So now the outsiders, there's a picture of not understanding spiritual things, a spiritual separation. And then there's this idea that those who are outside, God is going to judge. And then in the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, John sees the beauty of our heavenly home. And he says in chapter 22 that there are those who are outside. They're whoremongers. Sexual immorality. Sorcerers. You see, the outsiders that we find in the New Testament don't understand because they're spiritually separated. I believe they're lost or judged by God. Another representation of loss. And then Revelation chapter 22, those who are outside never get in because there's no citizenship in heaven for them. They've never trusted 
Christ. And what does Paul say? Walk in wisdom toward them. Be wise. Don't be foolish. Why? Because that's a soul. If they're outside, we don't want to do anything that is going to cause them to want to go further. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we compromise the truth. I'm saying we walk wise. We know the truth and how to apply it. And we're careful in our steps and in our words and in our actions and in our thoughts. There are things we will do and things we won't do. Why? Because there are people outside. I don't want them to stay outside. I want them to come in and trust Christ. I want them to be able to understand. I don't want them to be judged. I want them to experience the full citizenship of heaven. Like in Revelation 22, they're outsiders, and it's worth us being careful. How do we do it? Making the best use of time. Oh, time. You and I might go through seasons where our health fails, and there's a chance through medication or therapy that we can actually get that health back. That happens. Our body can heal. There may be some of you that have made bad investments financially. Maybe there's a stock market correction or a war in Europe, and it's caused you to lose some finances, a job change, whatever it is. You can lose money But under the right circumstances, you can get it back sometimes. You can't get time back. You can't. Once it is gone, it's gone. I can't add more. I don't even know how much I have. All I know is that this moment is precious and gone. There is no commodity that is as valuable as time. Isn't it amazing? This infinite, eternal God put us in time. Created time. The sun to mark the day and the moon, to rule the night, all in God's order. And what does Paul say? Make the best use of it. There are only five things you and I can do with our resources. We can waste them, save them, spend them, give them, or invest them. What Paul is calling us to do is to invest our time. Make the best use of this invaluable resource called time. You may not have another encounter with that person. You may not have another moment to be able to share your faith. I'm just being real. I'm not taking anything away from the sovereignty of God. I'm saying that if there are outsiders and they matter to God, and they do, They should matter to us. We should walk wisely. What does that wisdom look like? Making the best use of time. Not squander our valuable resource. Number four, we saw prayer, our place. Number three was our walk. And number four, our words. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. There are times in verses I know we say amen. There are times we say, oh my. This is an oh my. Words matter. I'll tell you that there are probably each one of you in here this morning If you were to think about it and go back, you would probably you would probably say that someone's words along your life impacted you greatly. Maybe it was negative. Maybe somebody said they hated you. Maybe somebody did not communicate your value and worth. Maybe somebody said, I'm done. 
on the other side of that? Maybe somebody did validate you. Maybe somebody did say you matter. Maybe somebody did say, I love you. Maybe somebody did say, I believe in you. Maybe somebody did say something that moved you. But listen, I would imagine that if we thought about it, every one of us could go back in our mind and think of a word or words that were strung together that were said from somebody that either tore us down or built us up. Because in our hearts, every one of us know these three things. Words are personal, words are powerful, and words are memorable. We know that because we hurt and we're helped by them. And what Paul is saying is this precious tool we have of words, use them carefully. Do not use them to tear down. Do not use them to wound. Do not use them to hurt because words are personal, powerful, and memorable. Use them for the gospel. Allow the gospel to penetrate our mouth. He says, let your speech be seasoned with salt. Mine often is cayenne pepper. And i got to stop it. I do. And you know, we say things, and it comes out, and we hate it, and we regret it, and we're guilty, and we're, ah! And just if you're not guilty, let's get guilty together. Can we? I don't want to do this alone. While we're all here, let's just look up on the screen and read James 3 together, Okay? Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now we're getting into some good stuff, where we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Hold on, we're diving in. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, though they're large and are driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder, wherever the whole pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great the forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and is set on fire of hell. I'm done. Words matter. God... Am I praying like I should? Am I persisting in this beautiful, incredible thing called prayer? That God, you want to hear from me. As insignificant, as small as I am, you want to hear from me. Some of you might say, Nobody's really ever cared about me. He does. He cares about you more than you will ever know this side of heaven. He wants to hear from you. He wants you, he wants to continue to hear from you. Your place. It's okay to admit to God this place stinks. I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. But at the end of the day, let's be honest. It's not about us. It's not. We want it to be about us, but it's not. It's about Him. That's the point of Colossians. Zoom out, friends. Zoom out. Life's not about me. God, help me seek your fruit over my freedom. By the way, you'll find that bearing fruit is freedom in the kingdom. Number three, what about my walk, God? In my day-to-day life, do I, does it show that I care about others? Am I a man of my word? Am I a woman of integrity? Am I a person that bears witness through my life of the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God? And what about my words? 
What about my words, God? Do my words validate my life? Does my life validate the words of my mouth? Am I using this incredible tool that is powerful, personal, and memorable? Am I stamping the gospel on my mouth to share, to be gracious, seasoned with salt? One thing salt did, it's only right that those who Jesus called the salt of the earth would speak salt. One of the things that salt does is hold off corruption. Protects. So should our words. They heal. And I pray today that in these four areas, prayer, place, walk, words, that we could say right where we are, we could ask God, has the gospel penetrated these four areas of my life? And if not, What steps need to take place in order for that to happen? And friend, I would be remiss if I did not say, if you are standing outside, that horrible, horrible place, only by the blood of Jesus Christ can you come inside. He stands ready, eager even today to receive you to the inside, a place of understanding, a place of love, a place where you are accepted in the beloved, a place of eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings.